Circles from Essays, First Series by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Read by Bob Neufeld. Nature centers into balls, and her proud ephemerals, fast to surface and outside, scan the profile of the sphere. Knew they what that signified? A new genesis were here. The eye is the first circle. The horizon which it forms is the second, and throughout nature this primary figure is repeated without end. It is the highest emblem in the cipher of the world. St. Augustine described the nature of God as a circle whose center was everywhere and its circumference nowhere. We are all our lifetime reading the copious sense of this first of forms. One moral we have already deduced in considering the circular or compensatory character of every human action. Another analogy we shall now trace, that every action admits of being outdone. Our life is an apprenticeship to the truth that around every circle another can be drawn, that there is no end in nature, but every end is a beginning, and that there is always another dawn risen on mid-noon, and under every deep a lower deep opens. The fact, as far as it symbolizes the moral fact of the unattainable, the flying perfect, around which the hands of man can never meet, at once the inspirer and the condemner of every success, may conveniently serve us to connect many illustrations of human power in every department. There are no fixtures in nature. The universe is fluid and volatile. Permanence is but a word of degrees. Our globe seen by God as a transparent law, not a mass of facts. The law dissolves the fact and holds it fluid. Our culture is the predominance of an idea which draws after it this train of cities and institutions. Let us rise into another idea. They will disappear. The Greek sculpture is all melted away, as if it had been statues of ice, here and there a solitary figure or fragment remaining, as we see flax and scraps of snow left in cold dells and mountain clefts in June and July. For the genius that created it creates now somewhat else. The Greek letters last a little longer, but already passing under the same sentence and tumbling into the inevitable pit which the creation of new thought opens for all that is old. The new continents are built out of the ruins of an old planet, the new races fed out of the decomposition of the foregoing, new arts destroy the old. See the investment of capital in aqueducts made useless by hydraulics, fortifications by gunpowder, roads and canals by railways, sails by steam, steam by electricity. You admire this tower of granite, weathering the hurts of so many ages, yet a little waving hand built this huge wall, and that which builds is better than that which is built. The hand that built can topple it down much faster. Better than the hand and nimbler was the invisible thought which wrought through it, and thus ever behind the coarse effect is a fine cause, which, being narrowly seen, is itself the effect of a finer cause. A rich estate appears to women a firm and lasting fact, to a merchant one easily created out of any materials and easily lost. An orchard, good tillage, good grounds seem a fixture, like a gold-mine or a river to a citizen, but to a large farmer not much more fixed than the state of the crop. Nature looks provokingly stable and secular, but it has a cause like all the rest, and when once I comprehend that, will these fields stretch so immovably wide, those leaves hang so individually considerable? Permanence is a word of degrees. Everything is medial. Moons are no more bounds to spiritual power than bat-balls. The key to every man is his thought. Sturdy and defying though he look, he has a helm which he obeys, which is the idea after which all his facts are classified. He can only be reformed by showing him a new idea which commands his own. The life of a man is a self-evolving circle, which, from a ring imperceptibly small, 
rushes on all sides outwards to new and larger circles, and that without end. The extent to which this generation of circles, wheel without wheel, will go, depends on the force or truth of the individual soul, for it is the inert effort of each thought, having formed itself into a circular wave of circumstance, as for instance an empire, rules of an art, a local usage, a religious rite, to heap itself on that ridge, and to solidify and hem in the life. But if the soul is quick and strong, it bursts over that boundary on all sides, and expands another orbit on the great deep, which also runs up into a high wave, with attempt again to stop and to bind. But the heart refuses to be imprisoned. In its first and narrowest pulses it already trends outward with a vast force, and to immense and innumerable expansions. Every ultimate fact is only the first of a new series. Every general law only a particular fact of some more general law presently to disclose itself. There is no outside, no enclosing wall, no circumference to us. The man finishes his story. How good! How final! How it puts a new face on all things! He fills the sky! Lo! on the other side rises also a man and draws a circle around the circle we had just pronounced the outline of the sphere then already is our first speaker not man but only a first speaker his only redress is forthwith to draw a circle outside of his antagonist and so men do by themselves the result of to-day which haunts the mind and cannot be escaped will presently be abridged into a word, and the principle that seemed to explain nature will itself be included as one example of a bolder generalization. In the thought of to-morrow there is a power to upheave all thy creed, all the creeds, all the literatures of the nations, and marshal thee to a heaven which no epic dream has yet depicted. Every man is not so much a workman in the world as he is a suggestion of that he should be. Men walk as prophecies of the next age. Step by step we scale this mysterious ladder. The steps are actions, the new prospect is power. Every several result is threatened and judged by that which follows. Every one seems to be contradicted by the new, it is only limited by the new. The new statement is always hated by the old, and to those dwelling in the old comes like an abyss of scepticism. But the eye soon gets wanted to it, for the eye and it are effects of one cause, and presently, all its energy spent, it pales and dwindles before the revelation of the new hour. Fear not the new generalization. Does the fact look crass and material, threatening to degrade thy theory of spirit? Resist it not. It goes to refine and raise thy theory of matter just as much. There are no fixtures to men, if we appeal to consciousness. Every man supposes himself not to be fully understood, and if there is any truth in him, if he rests at last on the divine soul, I see not how it can be otherwise. The last chamber, the last closet, he must feel was never opened. There is always a residuum unknown, unanalyzable. That is, every man believes that he has a greater possibility. Our moods do not believe in each other. Today I am full of thoughts and can write what I please. I see no reason why I should not have the same thought, the same power of expression tomorrow. What I write, whilst I write it, seems the most natural thing in the world. But yesterday I saw a dreary vacuity in this direction in which now I see so much, and a month hence, I doubt not, I shall wonder who he was that wrote so many continuous pages. Alas, for this infirm faith, this will not strenuous, this vast ebb of a vast flow! I am God in nature. I am a weed by the wall. The continual effort to raise himself above himself, to work a pitch above his last height, betrays itself in a man's relations. We thirst for approbation, yet cannot forgive the approver. 
the sweet of nature is love yet if i have a friend i am tormented by my imperfections the love of me accuses the other party if he were high enough to slight me then could i love him and rise by my affection to new heights a man's growth is seen in the successive choirs of his friends for every friend whom he loses for truth he gains a better i thought as i walked in the woods and mused on my friends why should i play with them this game of idolatry i know and see too well when not voluntarily blind the speedy limits of persons called high and worthy rich noble and great they are by the liberality of our speech but truth is sad o oh, blessed spirit whom i forsake for these they are not thou every personal consideration that we allow costs us heavenly state we sell the thrones of angels for a short and turbulent pleasure how often must we learn this lesson men cease to interest us when we find their limitations the only sin is limitation as soon as you once come up with a man's limitations it is all over with him has he talents has he enterprise has he knowledge it boots not infinitely alluring and attractive was he to you yesterday a great hope a sea to swim in now you have found his shores found it a pond and you care not if you never see it again each new step we take in thought reconciles twenty seemingly discordant facts as expressions of one law aristotle and plato are reckoned the respective heads of two schools a wise man will see that aristotle platonizes by going one step farther back in thought discordant opinions are reconciled by being seen to be two extremes of one principle and we can never go so far back as to preclude a still higher vision beware when the great god lets loose a thinker on this planet then all things are at risk it is as when a conflagration has broken out in a great city and no one knows what is safe or where it will end there is not a piece of science but its flank may be turned to-morrow there is not any literary reputation not the so-called eternal names of fame that may not be revised and condemned the very hopes of man the thoughts of his heart the religion of nations the manners and morals of mankind are all at the mercy of a new generalization generalization is always a new influx of the divinity into the mind hence the thrill that attends it valor consists in the power of self-recovery so that a man cannot have his flank turned cannot be outgeneraled but put him where you will he stands this can only be by his preferring truth to his past apprehension of truth and his alert acceptance of it from whatever quarter the intrepid conviction that his laws his relations to society his christianity his world may at any time be superseded and decease there are degrees in idealism we learn first to play with it academically as the magnet was once a toy then we see in the heyday of youth and poetry that it may be true that it is true in gleams and fragments then its countenance waxes stern and grand and we see that it must be true it now shows itself ethical and practical we learn that god is that he is in me and that all things are shadows of him the idealism of berkeley is only a crude statement of the idealism of jesus and that again is a crude statement of the fact that all nature is the rapid efflux of goodness executing and organizing itself much more obviously is history and the state of the world at any one time directly dependent on the intellectual classification then existing in the minds of men the things which are dear to men at this hour are so on account of the ideas which have emerged on their mental horizon and which cause the present order of things as a tree bears its apples a new degree of culture would instantly revolutionize the entire system of human pursuits conversation is a game of circles in conversation we pluck up the termini which bound the common of silence on every side 
The parties are not to be judged by the spirit they partake and even express under this Pentecost. Tomorrow they will have receded from this high-water mark. Tomorrow you shall find them stooping under the old pack saddles. Yet let us enjoy the cloven flame whilst it glows on our walls. When each new speaker strikes a new light, emancipates us from the expression of the last speaker to oppress us with the greatness and exclusiveness of his own thought, then yields us to another redeemer, we seem to recover our rights, to become men. Oh, what truths profound and executable only in ages and orbs are supposed in the announcement of every truth! In common hours society sits cold and statuesque. We all stand waiting, empty, knowing possibly that we can be full, surrounded by mighty symbols which are not symbols to us, but prose and trivial toys. Then cometh the god, and converts the statues into fiery men, and by a flash of his eye burns up the veil which shrouded all things, and the meaning of the very furniture, of cup and saucer, of chair and clock and tester, is manifest. The facts which loomed so large in the fogs of yesterday, property, climate, breeding, personal beauty, and the like, have strangely changed their proportions. All that we reckoned settled shakes and rattles, and literatures, cities, climates, religions, leave their foundations and dance before our eyes. And yet here again see the swift circumspection. Good as is discourse, silence is better, and shames it. The length of the discourse indicates the distance of thought betwixt the speaker and the hearer. If they were at perfect understanding in any part, no words would be necessary thereon. If at one in all parts, no words would be suffered. Literature is a point outside of our hodiernal circle, though through which a new one may be described. The use of literature is to afford us a platform whence we may command a view of our present life, a purchase by which we may move it. We fill ourselves with ancient learning, install ourselves the best we can in Greek, in Punic, in Roman houses, only that we may wiselier see French, English, and American houses and modes of living. In like manner we see literature best from the midst of wild nature, or from the din of affairs, or from a high religion. The field cannot be well seen from within the field. The astronomer must have his diameter of the earth's orbit as a base to find the parallax of any star. Therefore we value the poet. All the argument and all the wisdom is not in the encyclopedia, or the treatise on metaphysics, or the body of divinity, but in the sonnet or the play. In my daily work I incline to repeat my old steps, and do not believe in remedial force, in the power of change and reform. But some Petrarch or Ariosto, filled with the new wine of his imagination, writes me an ode or a brisk romance full of daring thought and action. He smites and arouses me with his shrill tones, breaks up my whole chain of habits, and I open my eye on my own possibilities. He claps wings to the sides of all the solid old lumber of the world, and I am capable once more of choosing a straight path in theory and practice. We have the same need to command a view of the religion of the world. We can never see Christianity from the catechism, from the pastures, from a boat in the pond, from amidst the songs of wooden birds, we possibly may. Cleansed by the elemental light and wind, steeped in the sea of beautiful forms which the field offers us, we may chance to cast a right glance back upon biography. Christianity is rightly dear to the best of mankind, yet was there never a young philosopher whose breeding had fallen into the Christian church by whom the brave text of Paul's was not specially prized? Then shall also the Son be subject unto him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Let the claims and virtues of persons be never so great and welcome, the instinct of man presses eagerly onward to the impersonal and illimitable, 
and gladly arms itself against the dogmatism of bigots with this generous word out of the book itself. The natural world may be conceived of as a system of concentric circles, and we now and then detect in nature slight dislocations which apprise us that this surface on which we now stand is not fixed, but sliding. These manifold tenacious qualities, this chemistry and vegetation, these metals and animals, which seem to stand there for their own sake, are means and methods only, are words of God and as fugitive as other words. Has the naturalist or chemist learned his craft, who has explored the gravity of atoms and the elective affinities, who has not yet discerned the deeper law whereof this is only a partial or approximate statement, namely that like draws to like, and that the goods which belong to you gravitate to you and need not be pursued with pains and cost? Yet is that statement approximate also, and not final? Omnipresence is a higher fact, not through subtle subterranean channels need friend and fact be drawn to their counterpart, but, rightly considered, these things proceed from the eternal generation of the soul. Cause and effect are two sides of one fact. The same law of eternal procession ranges all that we call the virtues, and extinguishes each in the light of a better. The great man will not be prudent in the popular sense. All his prudence will be so much deduction from his grandeur. But it behooves each to see, when he sacrifices prudence, to what god he devotes it. If to ease and pleasure, he had better be prudent still. If it to a great trust, he can well spare his mule and panniers, who has a winged chariot inside. Geoffrey draws on his boots to go through the woods, that his feet may be safer from the bite of snakes. Aaron never thinks of such a peril. In many years neither is harmed by such an accident. Yet it seems to me that with every precaution you take against such an evil, you put yourselves into the power of the evil. I suppose that the highest prudence is the lowest prudence. Is this too sudden a rushing from the centre to the verge of our orbit? Think how many times we shall fall back into pitiful calculations before we take up our rest in the great sentiment, or make the verge of today the new center. Besides, your bravest sentiment is familiar to the humblest men. The poor and the low have their way of expressing the last facts of philosophy as well as you. Blessed be nothing, and the worse things are, the better they are, are proverbs which express the transcendentalism of common life. One man's justice is another's injustice, one man's beauty another's ugliness, one man's wisdom another's folly, as one beholds the same objects from a higher point. One man thinks justice consists in paying debts, and has no measure in his abhorrence of another who is very remiss in this duty, and makes the creditor wait tediously. But the second man has his own way of looking at things, asks himself which debt must I pay first, the debt to the rich or the debt to the poor, the debt of money or the debt of thought to mankind, of genius to nature. For you, O oh broker, there is no other principle but arithmetic. For me, commerce is of trivial import, love, faith, truth of character, the aspiration of man, these are sacred. Nor can I detach one duty, like you, from all other duties, and concentrate my forces mechanically on the payment of monies. Let me live onward. You shall find that, though slower, the progress of my character will liquidate all these debts without injustice to higher claims. If a man should dedicate himself to the payment of notes, would not this be injustice? Does he owe no debt but money? and are all claims on him to be postponed to a landlord's or a banker's. There is no virtue which is final. All are initial. The virtues of society are vices of the saint. The terror of reform is the discovery that we must cast away our virtues, or what we have always esteemed such, into the same pit that has consumed our grosser vices. Forgive his crimes. Forgive his virtues, too, 
these smaller faults half converts to the right. It is the highest power of divine moments that they abolish our contritions also. I accuse myself of sloth and unprofitableness day by day, but when these waves of God flow into me I no longer reckon lost time, I no longer poorly compute my possible achievement by what remains to me of the month or the year. For these moments confer a sort of omnipresence and omnipotence which asks nothing of duration, but sees that the energy of the mind is commensurate with the work to be done without time. And thus, O oh circular philosopher, I hear some reader exclaim, you have arrived at a fine Pyrrhonism, at an equivalence and indifferency of all actions, and would fain teach us that if we are true, forsooth, our crimes shall be lively stones out of which we shall construct the temple of the true God. I am not careful to justify myself. I own I am gladdened by seeing the predominance of the saccharine principle throughout vegetable nature, and not less by beholding in morals that unrestrained inundation of the principle of good into every chink and hole that selfishness has left open, yea, into selfishness and sin itself, so that no evil is pure, no hell itself without its extreme satisfactions. But lest I should mislead any when I have my own head and obey my whims, let me remind the reader that I am only an experimenter. Do not set the least value on what I do, or the least discredit on what I do not, as if I pretended to settle anything as true or false. I unsettle all things. No facts are to me sacred, none are profane. I simply experiment, an endless seeker with no past at my back. Yet this incessant movement and progression which all things partake could never become sensible to us, but by contrast to some principle or fixture or stability in the soul. Whilst the eternal generation of circles proceeds, the eternal generator abides. That central life is somewhat superior to creation, superior to knowledge and thought, and contains all its circles. For ever it labors to create a life and thought as large and excellent as itself, but in vain, for that which is made instructs how to make it better. Thus there is no sleep, no pause, no preservation, but all things renew, germinate, and spring. Why should we import rags and relics into the new hour? Nature abhors the old, and old age seems the only disease. All things run into this one. We call it by many names, fever, intemperance, insanity, stupidity, and crime. They are all forms of old age. They are rest, conservatism, appropriation, inertia. Not newness, not the way onward. We grizzle every day. I see no need of it. Whilst we converse with what is above us, we do not grow old, but grow young. Infancy, youth, receptive, aspiring, with religious eyes looking upward, counts itself nothing, and abandons itself to the instruction flowing from all sides. But the man and woman of seventy assume to know all. They have outlived their hope. They renounce aspiration accept the actual for the necessary, and talk down to the young. Let them then become organs of the Holy Ghost, let them be lovers, let them behold truth, and their eyes are uplifted, their wrinkles smoothed, they are perfumed again with hope and power. This old age ought not to creep on a human mind. In nature every moment is new, the past is always swallowed and forgotten, the coming only is sacred. But nothing is secure but life, transition, the energizing spirit. No love can be bound by oath or covenant to secure it against a higher love. No truth so sublime but it may be trivial to-morrow in the light of new thoughts. People wish to be settled. Only as far as they are unsettled is there any hope for them. Life is a series of surprises. We do not guess today the mood, the pleasure, the power of tomorrow when we are building up our being. 
of lower states of acts of routine and sense we can tell somewhat but the masterpieces of god the total growths and universal movements of the soul he hideth they are incalculable i can know that truth is divine and helpful but how it shall help me i can have no guess for so to be is the sole inlet of so to know the new position of the advancing man has all the powers of the old yet has them all new it carries in its bosom all the energies of the past yet is itself an exhalation of the morning i cast away in this new moment all my once hoarded knowledge as vacant and vain now for the first time seem i to know anything rightly the simplest words we do not know what they mean except when we love and aspire the difference between talents and character is adroitness to keep the old and trodden round and power and courage to make a new road to new and better goals character makes an overpowering present a cheerful determined hour which fortifies all the company by making them see that much is possible and excellent that was not thought of. Character dulls the impression of particular events. When we see the conqueror, we do not think much of any one battle or success. We see that we had exaggerated the difficulty. It was easy to him. The great man is not convulsible or tormentable. Events pass over him without much impression people say sometimes see what i have overcome see how cheerful i am see how completely i have triumphed over these black events not if they still remind me of the black events true conquest is the causing the calamity to fade and disappear as an early cloud of insignificant result in a history so large and advancing the one thing which we seek with insatiable desire is to forget ourselves, to be surprised out of our propriety, to lose our sempiternal memory, and to do something without knowing how or why. In short, to draw a new circle. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. The way of life is wonderful, it is by abandonment. The great moments of history are the facilities of performance through the strength of ideas, as the works of genius and religion. A man, said Oliver Cromwell, never rises so high as when he knows not whither he is going. Dreams and drunkenness, the use of opium and alcohol, are the semblance and counterfeit of this oracular genius, and hence their dangerous attraction for men. For the like reason they ask the aid of wild passions, as in gaming and war, to ape in some manner these flames and generosities of the heart. End of Circles